Why don't you pray with me? We'll send our young people off. Lord, thank you so much for this morning, the opportunity to gather and to worship your great name, that you alone are God, that we, uh, we found a world that treasures so many different things and uh, worships so many different things that uh, you, we, we just ask, Lord, that your spirit would be moving in such a way this morning that you would position our hearts to worship and treasure you alone as God that we would look and see your wondrous works and your marvelous ways and think there is no one like you, God. We pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, if you're kindergarten through fifth grade, you follow those kids getting the heart rate up there. So hopefully we put away like all of the sugar that was sitting out on that little coffee bar that they're like making the, the way towards right now. Uh, probably why they're out there so fast. They can beat the adults through the sugar line. They can grab like four cookies each and really uh, give themselves a hard time for the next half hour. The rest of us, you just have to stay awake. So if you've got a Bible, you can grab it. You can open it to Philippians chapter 3. We're going to spend some time in Philippians 3 this morning. Uh, Let me kind of help you with what we're doing over the next several weeks as a church and and why we're doing it. Um, uh, I'll, I'll use it by way of illustration. I have a, a friend in Michigan who is constantly uh, roping me into doing things that I would not otherwise have any motivation in doing. And so a few years ago, he had called me and said, hey, like, let's run together and we'll, we'll run a marathon. And I was like, that sounds horrible. I was right. Uh, it is. It's Absolutely horrible. Don't want to do it again. Uh, but we, we complete that, right? And then a couple of years goes by, and he called me at the beginning of last year, and he said, let's sign up for a triathlon. I was like, that sounds three times as horrible as running does, right? And, and I was right again. Uh, in particular, though, uh, by that point in time, like I had, I had been running for years now. Uh, I ride the bike sometimes during the summer. Uh, but there was one of those three disciplines that seemed to terrify me quite a bit, which was swimming. Um, because it, it, if you didn't know this, they, they have a pretty big like triathlon that draws thousands and thousands of people every year in Madison. And right before COVID, the last year that they had done it, uh, two, not one, but two people in the water had heart attacks and died while swimming. Like real possibility. And these are like people in better shape than you and I, right? And so uh, I thought, well, that that sounds pretty awful. And so next thing you know, not only are you signed up for it, you're paying money to actually go do this dumb thing. And so uh, I was like, all right, whatever. And and so uh, I decided that what I ought to do is I ought to to really start swimming so that I could at least lessen the likelihood that I would have a heart attack and die in the water. And so, uh, in fact, the year before, uh, that summer, we had gone to Governor Governor Dodge. Uh, we had a little kayak. We brought it with us. And so while we're out there, I had suggested to Whitney, you know, let me see how, how swimming goes, whatever. And so we got out and I had like the wetsuit on and was doing like the, the plan and everything was good. And I was like, you just kayak next to me and I'll swim and we'll see if I can go a mile or two and see kind of how long that takes and how hard it is or whatever. <laughs> I, got, I got 80 yards from the shore and I was so panicked and freaking out. Every time I touched seaweed, I thought Jaws was coming up to get me. Anybody like, you know, I, and I should have known when I was a kid, like I wouldn't get in the pool without putting the goggles on and checking first to see if there was like a killer whale inside of my pool. I just always kind of had the psychology that the, something was going to go wrong. It went so wrong that I had to grab onto the back of the kayak and make her drag me back to shore. Like I could not swim to shore. It was like, please, behind you. Well, there was quite a bit of fear, it, and so I began to swim. I got a membership about this time of year to the YMCA. I would drive multiple times a week, and I'd just go swim until I couldn't swim anymore. And, like, slowly but surely, you're getting a little better at it, a little better at it, a little better at it, and you're kind of learning, like, the form. It took me a while to realize, like, you just got to put your head down, and, and you can breathe when you need to, but you're not going to drown if your head is in the water because it's hard to kind of get that at first. Months go by, and I'm kind of getting better and better, a little more, like, efficient and confident in the water. And so we made it to the beginning of the summer. Uh, We went back to Michigan for a little vacation. Whitney's parents live on a lake, and I thought, it's it's time. It's a little redemption. 
I'm going to get out there, and I'm going to swim in the lake, and it's going to go well. And so uh, we kind of get in the water, and Whitney's next to me in a little kayak. I'm like, you just paddle along with me. We're going to swim all the way out there. I had like kind of looked, picked out a spot. It's like four or 500 yards away. I was like, we're going to swim out there. I'm going to turn around. We're going to swim back. You're just going to have to coast along next to me. Everything is going to go really well. And so I, I start going, and it's going way better than the year before. Way better. I mean, we're, we're like 90 yards out, and I haven't stopped yet. So I'm like, you know, I'm not feeling like I need to be dragged back in. Uh, and so uh, things are kind of progressing, and I just, you know, just swimming down. You know, I, I got my eyes closed because I realized that psychologically that's the only way I can really make sure that I'm not like fearing a huge sea turtle up and just biting my toes off or whatever you fear. I don't know what you should be afraid of, but uh, you should. Have you seen that river monster show, right? Like there's things to be afraid of, all right? So it's rational. And so uh, we're going, we're going, we're going. And so uh, 10, 12, 15 minutes goes by and I'm swimming and I feel great. You know? And so finally I decide, all right, it's probably about time. I'm probably pretty close to destination and I should, I should turn around. And so I kind of like take a breath and I look up and we are in a part of the lake that I don't even know if I've ever been in. Like, I was so far off course that I had never even imagined that, like, if I were to just put my head down and swim, I don't swim in a straight line. I swim in, like, a banana-shaped curve that put me uh, at least 100 yards away from where I was actually supposed to be. And Whitney was like, I was yelling at you, but you like earplugs in. I'm under the water, you know. Okay, listen, I'm not paying attention to you. Just trying not to die out here. And so I realized like one of the things that I was going to need to do when I was no longer in the pool was frequently while swimming, I was going to need to spot. And so uh, from that point forward, you would set a target ahead of you, and on occasion, you'd have to take a breath up instead of to the side so that you could look to see how you were doing and readjust. And all along the way, you would continue to do this because unlike the pool, you don't have a little black line that you can follow along with that you're constantly trying to check and see where are we headed are we on pace? And, and here's, here's why this matters. Because in the reality of our lives, even as Christians, I think one of the things that has a tendency to grip us is you can kind of get in a motion where you sort of put your head down and you just do what you're supposed to do. And you just wake up and you get to the rhythm of life that you're supposed to be in. You travel through it. You go to sleep. You wake up the next morning. You do the same thing again and again and again and again. And sometimes, even with good intentions, if we don't take a pause to kind of look up, to spot where it is we're going, to pay attention to the goal and mark our progress and check how far we've drifted from side to side, we won't find ourselves long term, where we desire to be, but we might find that we slowly have drifted to the right or to the left without so much as an understanding that we have done so. Amen? You ever find yourself at a point of life where you go, how did I possibly allow something to get this bad? How did I possibly allow it to get this off course? How did I possibly find myself this far away from where I intended to be? I think that's the reality of our human nature is we have a tendency to do that. Now, not only is that a reality of our human nature, but I think the context of what it looks like as believers in the church, our spiritual life has a tendency to be this way. And so uh, typically what we do as a church is week in and week out, uh, we just press on through series of the Bible. We believe that God's word is inspired by him. It's true. It's profitable for teaching. And so uh, we just simply pick texts in the Bible and teach through them and kind of move in series. In fact, before Christmas, we were in a series in Ephesians. We haven't finished that series. We'll be back in there sometime in February. Uh, However, what we found was when the calendar turned, it's a good and appropriate time for us to take a minute to just look up and check as a church, where are we in line with and on the course that we desire to be in godliness? And so uh, we've taken, this is our second of a few weeks in a series uh, where we're kind of paying attention to what we desire to see God do and work among us as a body of believers 
in this place. And so if you were uh, not with us last week, we talked about the idea that we wanted to be a body of believers, a community that was focused first and foremost on God-centric worship. That our desire would be to make much of the God of the universe. That we wouldn't get lost in the uh, kind of kind of rhythms of what so often happens where church can become this idea of check the box or uh, make sure that we have accomplished the task that we need to accomplish or uh, what I think happens often we'll talk a little more about today the idea that uh, we just we just come so we can learn like how to do some good things in our lives and make sure that we're a little more moral and a little more responsible and a little better than we were the day before and that we uh, can find ourselves sort of losing sight of the Lord altogether and so Uh, The desire for us is that every week, week in, week out, that our goal, our purpose here would be to glorify and make much of God, not us. And so uh, we move on this week and we get into uh, the second thing that we've we've just kind of said. These are things that we resolve ourselves to be about as a church. Not the gospel, it's not the Bible, but, and it's really not even an exhaustive list of the things that we're commanded to be within the Bible, uh, but I think it, it covers a broad sweeping core tenets of what we exist to be believers. And so we said God-centric worship, and then we said our, our focus ought to be a people who are maturing in Christ and our love for one another, that we would be maturing, we'd be growing and developing, that it would be an ongoing process of growing and developing as believers for those of us who are in Christ. And so uh, in order to kind of talk about what that looks like, we're going to Philippians 3. I want to read a relatively longer passage of scripture to you, and then we'll, we'll talk about what it is that's going on in this passage that is so relevant to us some 2,000 years later. Begins Philippians 3, we're going to pick up in verse 3, and, and we'll explain kind of what's going on here in just a moment. He says, for we are the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God, and glory in Christ Jesus, and put no confidence in the flesh, although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh. If anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I have far more. Circumcised the eighth day, the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness, which is in the law, found blameless. But, Whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish that I may gain Christ, and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death in order that I may obtain the resurrection of the dead. So let's pause there and we'll uh, we'll talk a little bit. Here's here's what I think uh, happens oftentimes in our... uh, American church culture, modern culture, is that uh, many times someone comes to know Christ and finds themselves in the difficulty or the struggle that happens between the idea of last week and the idea of this week. So last week we said, that we ought to be a people who are focused on God-centric worship, that we should be a people who live in gratitude, desiring to glorify the God of our salvation. And I think, by and large, if you're a Christian, you kind of grasp that idea and go, yeah, I would agree with that, but how? In in fact, I can remember pretty distinctly uh, several years ago now, it's... (laughs) getting older and older and older and longer and longer and longer. My wife cut my hair this week and uh, commented on how hard it is to now cut this part because uh, we got a little migration going on right in here. And, uh, and so I was like, you got to leave it longer, right? Like just right in here and this little spot back here, we got to make sure we can provide some coverage, right? And so uh, in this, it's more like a zone defense my hair is playing now, you know? And so... Uh, 
So in this, uh, I noticed, though, that as I think back, my sophomore year in college, something distinctly different had happened in my life. I didn't, for some of you, you can relate to this. I didn't grow up in a church environment. Uh, we had a pretty moral home, but it was not a Christian home. And so uh, as a freshman in college, I began to be kind of challenged with, is this real? Is this true? Do I want any part of this? And through um, some searching and some reading and some conversations with people, I began to feel like, you know, I think this God thing is legitimate. I think that this Christ resurrected is true, and I think it is deserving of what the Bible calls full acceptance. It's deserving of my life that, that I ought to trust this and follow this. And so my sophomore year, I went back to college and kind of newly committed to this idea that I wanted to live for Christ and confused this to, how do you do that? I, I don't really know what changes other than a few things. What, what does it look like to live? Christian. And it was in that context, uh, I went to a retreat with some other believers for a weekend, my sophomore year of college, and remember uh, very vividly the speaker for that weekend speaking on this text in Philippians 3. If I have a favorite text in the Bible, this is it. He sat down and he began to talk about what it looks like to live a life that was transformed by Christ, a life that matures in Christ. You see, here's, here's the first way to answer this how question, how would we mature in Christ, is uh, quite frankly and simply that we must be in Christ. You, you can't mature in Christ unless you are indeed in Christ. Now, maybe that seems obvious to you. However, when I consider the lifestyle and the activity of most Christians, and, and when I consider it in the context of Christian culture today, it does not seem that obvious. In fact, I think the most popular understanding of what it means to mature in the church world that we live in today is it means that you start to do more responsible stuff. Amen? Most, most frequently, people would describe the Christian life on a basis of things that you do and things that you don't do. You want to be a good Christian? Well, you start going to church and you stop these words, and you start being more responsible with your Bible reading, and you stop watching those shows on television, and you start doing this thing, and you stop doing this thing, and you start doing this thing, and you stop doing this thing. Amen? You with me so far? That's called legalism. That's, that's an idea that you could follow some rules, and the more you do, and the better you do, the more you will find that you are drawing closer and closer to God. Now, now here's the thing, right? Morally speaking, there is some value in getting away from or putting off some things that are broken and wrong and unhealthy for you. And there's some value to putting on things that are good and healthy for you. If you are not a Christian and you begin to read the Bible and you begin to study the Bible, even beyond and outside of it transforming your life and potentially making you a Christian, there's going to be value in that. No doubt about it. However, Here's, here's the reality that Paul notes, is that you could get lost in this idea that what it means to please and to worship God is fully placed on the burden of you doing certain things, saying certain things, not doing other things, and not saying other things, and find it all on the basis of what you work at and what you work at not doing that you could find yourself so attached to the idea that being a mature Christian, being a good Christian, is more about doing the right things than it is about knowing Christ, being in Christ. And here's the danger of it. This is uh, what Paul says about this, is he says if anybody could have confidence in that being a reality, he has you beat. Because the reality is, uh, even on our best days, we're not good enough to please God. And this is what Paul had realized. He says, here's the thing. Let me tell you about my resume. He says, I was an Israelite. I was born with the right heritage. I was circumcised on the eighth day. I came from the right tribe. 
had the right teachers growing up. He says, I learned all of the law. I became a Pharisee. That was a word for a lawyer uh, specifically, not what we think of lawyers now. You're like, yeah, kind of scummy, you know. Uh, (laughs) I shouldn't have said that. There's good lawyers out there. Just haven't met them. But in that, take that back. My wife's cousin's a lawyer. I know one. Okay, so in that, uh, (laughs) just in case he's watching online, Deep breath, right? So in, this, in, in those days, though, a lawyer was not what we think of in the profession. A lawyer was somebody who was an expert on biblical Jewish law. It meant that they memorized what we know as the Old Testament. It meant that they could recall massive parts of Scripture at all times. It meant that of the 613 laws, either things that they were told to do or things that they were told to abstain from, they knew and had them all committed to heart. And he said, according to the righteousness that could be found by that law, I was blameless. On the surface, on the outside, in my attitude, in the behavior that could be seen, I had kept all of those things to perfection. I was blameless. I was living as moralistic and helpful of a life as anyone you could ever imagine. And yet he knew this. Verse 7, whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as lost for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things as lost. And then listen to this phrase. In view of of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, whom I've suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ. What's the surpassing value? Well, the surpassing value was to know Jesus my Lord was bigger and better because the confidence that I have is in Jesus as Lord, not in my own flesh. Why is that so important? Why does that matter so much? Because, because even in our righteousness, we fall short of what God desires of us. That's what the Bible tells us. It says there's none righteous, not even one. There's no one who seeks God. For all have sinned and fall short of God's glory. That even on our best days, we're just not quite there. In fact, uh, even, I had a conversation with someone this week talking about... Uh, our actions being one thing, but our motivations being what God is actually after, right? Here's what happens for many of us, especially if you are church folk, that even your good deeds can be done with a bitter and rotten heart. Ever been there? One of, my, one of my favorite accounts in the whole of the scriptures is in Acts chapter 5. Uh, if you know a little bit about your Bible, the book of Acts is the recording of the early church and what they're doing. In Acts chapter 5, there's a couple who has seen just a little while before somebody sell some land, give the money to the church, and be given uh, a great deal of praise and encouragement for it because it's allowed the church to flourish and go forth. And they see it and they think, Wow. Worked out pretty well for that guy. That guy's name is Barnabas, by the way. We know him throughout the scriptures. His name wasn't always Barnabas. That means son of encouragement. He was given that name after his generosity. Given position in the church, flourishing, going forward. And so the couple, Ananias and Sapphira, sees this and goes, Man, we own a field. What if we do the same thing so that praise would come to us? And just in case it doesn't, let's kind of take some of the money, back pocket that, hold on to it. We don't need to tell the church that we did this. Let's give the rest of it and pretend that that's the price we sold the land for. You know what happens to them? (laughs) Some of you do. It's great. That was New Testament account. They die, both of them. God kills them. Down. I don't know if the sound was, it's okay. okay. It wasn't together, right? One comes in, lies, dies. The next one comes in, they go, hey, uh, was this true? So-and-so said this. Yeah. Oh, well, same people are going to carry your body out. And then it's gone, right? Why, Why is it? Because the Bible is not first and foremost a book of rules regarding your moral behavior. First and foremost, the Bible is after and desiring what your motivation is. 
It's so much deeper than just how you would behave on the outside. This is what Paul had seen. And so what it meant to mature was to understand that it wasn't self-discipline that would ultimately carry us through. Some of you are so convinced that if I just get up and make my bed in the morning or if I just do the next right thing, I'm sorry, but like your frozen uh, theology is... Nobody watches Frozen, right? That's, I couldn't remember if it was Elsa or Anna, right? But the one that sings the thing, like, all I've got to do is the next right thing. That's, that's not true. The reality is that though discipline is valuable, self-discipline will never find you in harmony and in right relationship with God. You'll just be chasing after something you can never obtain. So how do we mature in Christ? Well, first and foremost, maturity comes from an ever-deepening faith in Christ not in selfish discipline, that I might gain Christ and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I might know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death in order that I might obtain resurrection from the dead. Now, and the very natural question that comes from this, if you're uh, somebody who wants instructions like me, is, well, so what do I do? Am I to just not seek to do anything by means of discipline? If you're saying, my hard work, my self-discipline, my choosing good over evil just is not going to get there on my own, am I to just give that all up? No, here's, here's how Paul continues on to talk about this. What does it look like to mature in Christ? Well, it begins in Christ, but then in this, maturity does come from a place of godly discipline. You see, I don't think we drop the idea of discipline, but we I drop the idea that we can have this discipline in our own resolve, in ourself, and not in a dependency upon God. Watch how Paul describes it here in verse 12. He says, not that I've already obtained it, that it is the resurrection from the dead, the perfection in Christ, or have I already become perfect, or that word in uh, Greek means mature, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regret myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as are perfect, have this attitude. And if anything, you have a different attitude, God will reveal that also to you. However, let us keep living by the same standard to which we have attained. He says, you've been given this salvation, and so what does it look like? Well, maturity looks like a godly discipline to press on toward that. Now, there are several, uh, there's just a myriad of things we could talk about and what godly discipline looks like, but there's one in particular that he's noting here that I think uh, we as a church, and not just here at First Baptist, I think this is a cultural problem, uh, ought to be more disciplined in, ought to practice with more vigor is this, that we forget what lies behind and we press on, and that when our attitude is not in line with godliness, it would be revealed to us, it would adjust, it would change. The Bible word for this is called repentance. It means a change of course or a change of direction, that what it looks like to mature in Christ is a constant recognition and a constant building and awareness of areas of your life that aren't what they're supposed to be. And as those things are revealed to us, we begin to change course. We begin to bring those things into submission and into conformity in Christ. And that this is an ever ongoing process. That's why he says, I haven't obtained it yet, but I press on. That I'm onwardly thinking about how God is going to change, how he's going to reform my life as I repent from sin and move towards a godly lifestyle. 
You know, I'll take you back to that uh, story from the beginning. As I kind of learn now how to swim and spot, uh, we continue on. I train. I do all this stuff in September of this last year. was actually the day of the race. Uh, And you begin the race, and one thing that I realized I hadn't really trained for was just the volume of people who are there with you. I think, actually, I think we got a picture of uh, what it looks like in the water. And so we'll, we'll try to throw that up. But in this, right, you get into the water, and there's literally like 2,000 people who are there swimming with you. Looks like that, right? Like like that. And so uh, as you begin to swim, you're getting punched, like frequently, right? Like I've never been hit so many times in my life in the course of just a few minutes. And so like every time you feel like you're getting in a rhythm, like somebody hits you or grabs you or you hit somebody or grab them and you, you know, I don't really feel bad about it. In fact, the more often you get punched, the more willing you are to punch someone else. Amen? Right? Like it just seems like sweet justice. And so, uh, out, you're not, it's not the same people, but you know, like hit somebody else because I got hit. And so uh, as, as time is going on though, you try to find like a lane or a place where you can swim relatively undisturbed. Uh, about halfway through the race, I'm feeling pretty good about this. And then uh, as I've gone for like a minute or two without touching anybody else, I'm thinking, boy, this is going really well. This is going really well. But because I've been hit so many times already, I've forgotten the thing that I was supposed to do all along, right? Which is to look up, to spot, and see where it was that I'm going. Until the next person that I hit, I didn't hit beside them. I hit the middle of their back as they were swimming this way. And I thought, something has gone wrong, right? And so I stopped swimming, and I look up, and sure enough, I am like a solid 100 yards outside of the course, swimming this way, and the course is this way. Like, man, sure glad I hit that person, right? And so what do I have to do? Reorient and and head back into the right direction. Here's here's what the Christian life has a tendency to be as we mature in Christ. It is constantly changing our direction. It is recognizing day by day, I failed here. I'm off course here. I've misaligned myself here. I didn't understand this right. I didn't do this right. I didn't think this right. I didn't react right. And adjust. And adjust. And adjust and adjust. And the thing that I didn't do then and the thing that we don't do in Christ, we don't look back and spend the whole of our life in regret. What if I had thought, oh, well, I, better, I better swim backwards so that I can get back on the track and then uh, I'll be back where I went off course in the first place and then turn on. No, that doesn't make any sense, right? We forget what lies behind and we press on. We repent and we adjust and we move on towards the prize of the upward call of Christ Jesus. What does it look like to mature in Christ? It is a constant. It is a daily, sometimes by the hour, sometimes by the minute process of repentance and moving forward in the Lord and in his glory. And then, one more thing. He goes, let us keep living by the standard to which we have obtained Now, how do we do this without finding ourselves distracted every single second? I, you know, maybe I'm a little more ADD than most of you, but I find that there are the shiny objects every minute of the day. Something to draw my attention, something to draw my affections, something to draw me away. How do I make sure that I'm just not constantly readjusting from one wrong view to another wrong view to another wrong view to another wrong view? What helps me? What is it that I am actually spotting and looking at? Well, watch what he says. Brethren, join me in following my example. Observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. For many walk of whom I often told you, and now tell you, even weeping, that they're enemies of the cross, whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. He says, here's, here's what it looked like to miss. Here's what it looked like to be in the wrong direction, is to continue to set your mind on earthly things. Many have done it, many will do it, but 
our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. Maturing in Christ is a reminder and a recognition over and over and over again of what I call an eternal perspective. Our citizenship is in heaven. You are just here for a time. Just a moment, right? Uh, we, we tend to think of our lives as so long and so significant. You know the illustration that the Bible uses for your life? It's like dew. Dew. That's not here today, gone tomorrow. Dew shows up in the morning and by afternoon it is scorched and gone. It says you're like a mist, a vapor. You're here for a little while and then vanish. Your time on this earth is short. And so you set your mind on earthly things and I promise you will be disappointed. You find your treasure, your value in the things of this world, I promise you, you will be disappointed. Because moths will come and rust will corrupt and you will find them to be fleeting as they are destroyed. But if your citizenship is in heaven, if you eagerly await a savior, there your heart will be also where your treasure is that you will continue to press on because that's the prize. That's the goal. Christ, eternal, forever, does not rot, does not rust, does not fleet, will not be destroyed. What does it look like to mature in Christ? Every day, it looks like us reminding, reminding, reminding. Our citizenship is in heaven. We're made for more than this. Whatever this life can throw at you cannot destroy your hope. It is a heavenly hope. Whatever this life can give to you, it cannot fulfill your hope. It is a heavenly hope. Whether your circumstances are great and glorious, whether your circumstances are horrendous and difficult, they are but temporary because our citizenship is in heaven for a view of Christ that surpasses anything this world can give. All things as loss in view of the surpassing value of Christ Jesus our Lord. Why don't you pray with me? Lord, guide us, direct us, Lord, lead us in what it looks like to follow. And I pray two things for, for us as a people. Lord, that there are some in here this morning who have been working so hard. They're, they're working to be good. For so many of them, they're the give you the shirt off their back kind of people. They're moral, they're upright, they're nice, they're kind. And yet, they've never placed their faith in you. And they feel. Lord, I, I pray that by the work and the conviction of your spirit, they would feel it right now. The weight and the burden as, as hard as they try. Just not good enough. Deep down they know there's areas of selfishness, pride. There's a pain and a longing. I pray that you would help them know this morning that it's not by working harder, that it's got to come in a view of you as Lord, that they would have faith in you maybe for the first time in their lives, that you would transform. That all of the things of this world, even their own attitudes and their own good workings and their own uh, 
ability to be moral would be counted as loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing you. I pray that for them. And I, and I pray for the many in this room who do know that. That you would convict and you would encourage this morning that we would forget what lies behind and that we would press on. And that as we are revealed over and over and over again to have an attitude that, that veers off of what is good and righteous and yours, that you would show it to us and you would correct it in us. And that we would continue to set our eyes on our eternal hope, our citizenship in heaven, so that it would draw us back to you again and again and again. Lead us in it, Lord, by the power of your spirit. Pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.